The brothers wish. The brothers wish, brothers wish. The brothers wish. The brothers. Now hey everybody, this Greg is the is Brothers the Wisp number 65. Uh, me, I am Greg Soul, coming here from Texas. Top left, we've got Justin Wilson from Indy. You have to say hello so they recognize howdy, your Howdy, howdy. <laughs> Most people aren't watching this, they're listening to it. Uh, maybe for a little bit, we've got Thomas Kernak. He's currently in the middle of a power outage, so he's got nothing better to do than sit on here and talk with us. Hello, everyone. And then top right, we got Mike Hammett out of Chicago land. What's up, Mikey? Oh, just uh, been been fighting this weekend trying to set up a uh, uh, PM accounting. I think that's how you say the, that package name. It's uh, doing some NetFlow stuff. Yeah, I noticed. Uh, I noticed that in the Slack, asking some different questions there. And speaking of the Slack. Uh, we have a Patreon-only Slack uh, group, and uh, not only is Mike getting help with that, uh, let's see, what else, what other kind of nuggets were there? Uh, Steve Gilbert and Josh Reynolds had a spirited debate. I think it, I mean, it, it was going on for like an hour plus yesterday. Um, and then it somehow devolved into, um, uh, their spirited debate was over security practices, I'm sorry. And then, uh, you know, of like large companies and, and who can actually... Uh, afford to protect your services and yeah, all that stuff uh, very opinion laden and then it devolved into uh, talking about small Linux installs I don't I don't know how that ended up happening but the source of things do uh, let's see Ryan McAfee and Michael Lingwell we're talking about LMR applications uh, and then uh, Jeremy and thrift were talking about Ceph clusters and Proxmox right so there's a lot of really good stuff going on in there and if you want to jump on Drop over to our uh, Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the Brothers West. Join up. Let's see. What else do we have? Um, it, it, um, it, um, I noticed that you didn't uh, mention my self-deprecation there. Yeah, yeah. We, are, we already, it was in there. <laughs> Hang on just a second. Back. Yeah, yeah. I didn't mention that. It's, Mike says that he's always asking for help of one kind or another. Uh, but, I mean, everybody does. I mean, that's what it's there for, right? It's the brain trust. One man can't know all things, but... Uh, through the group we are stronger uh, add us all together we might actually equal one normal man so that's good uh let's see I don't, I don't think you can add a bunch of degenerates and get one normal person i don't know you just take the good bits take the normal bits out of there you know what happens you know whatever makes it through the sifter uh that happens to, to be left over so let's see some of the notes mike put in uh, or has been putting in the Facebook, right? All those great notes come from him. Uh, Shinog is coming up in May. Uh, I think it's like May 10th, right? It's really soon. Um, yeah. Tom Kopchinski. I met that guy at Nanog. Super cool cat. He runs the Shinog thing. Be sure to go and say hi to him. Uh, some really good stuff. He's a super smart dude. He's way smarter than me. Um, let's see what else. Wisp America. Is that next week? You have to, uh, you have to leave tomorrow, right, Justin? Or no, I leave tomorrow, then we leave on Monday. Yeah, Monday. Okay. Yeah, I'm just coming down to stay the place, probably at Scott's, so I'm not having to drive down there in the morning. All right, and that one's in... Birmingham, um, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Edit that one out. Sorry. It's cold. <laughs> Making me do all kinds of crazy stuff. Anyway. Yeah, so that one's in Birmingham, Alabama. You guys uh, looking forward to anything in particular? Um, I don't know. I haven't had time to look at anything. Yeah, I haven't had much time to, to look at anything either. Who is it? Mimosa is doing some secret announcement. Oh, that's cool. That, uh, well, it's secret to some people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret to me. I don't know. I'm not on the inside track. It uh, well, I mean, it, it helps you just show up with their headquarters and say, "Hey, show me around." Hmm. Fair enough. All right. Well, that's cool. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, Mike posted before Open VPN is hard. I think it's actually not that bad. I did a video tutorial, my first one in three years. Somebody was happy to point out. I thought that was hilarious. Uh, so <laughs> somebody's keeping track. I knew it was a long time, uh, and I honestly I want to get back into to doing those because. Uh, I actually really enjoy that. Uh, just 
haven't made time. Everybody's got time for everything, right? Can you make time to do those things? To what <laughs> end? Uh, I don't know. It's a, well, and like, you know, I think what, what my problem with OpenVPN was, was that I, you know, I looked at the guides and it was, it was, you know, you know, generate your, you know, CA, you know, certificate authority on the Microtech, you know, and then do this. And I'm like, no, I don't want any of that self certified stuff. I can spend $8 of a real certificate. <laughs> Why would I do like $8 is not a lot of money to get a real cert. Why would I do that? I don't know. Because so it takes the next 30 day. seconds. Yeah. It takes 30 seconds to make a self signed cert. That's why. It's a, well, and then I ended up finding <laughs> out through some uh, through some conversation and whatnot that apparently, unless you're like a PKI expert, um, you just do the self cert. Like that's what they just took, you know, just just do that. What Don't you do? bother with the other stuff. Were you doing it router to router, or was it like clients to router? Uh, client to router. All right, well, that's um, a little different. <laughs> my my intention was. Uh, I wanted to create always on VPNs with laptops. Uh, one of my clients has a problem where one of their, uh, you know, ro uh, road warriors never takes the laptop to a company location uh, <laughs> ever. Um, well, the laptop now belongs to somebody else who's, I made a, you know, I made an account but because they're not on the domain, nobody knows a local admin password. Um, they can't log into the machine. So it's just a brick. <laughs> because the old guys can, and we don't know his password, and can't. And if I reset it on the domain, I can't get in because it's. You can't log into the computer. <laughs> so it's a big, big circle. Of, you can't use the computer because you can't log into it, uh, you know, remotely. So I. I was trying to find ways of doing it always on VPN, and, and somebody said that the Open VPN, you know, Windows client sets up as a service. So then, as soon as Windows kicks on, it, it, you know, establishes that VPN. And so that's man, that's where I go, I'm trying to get that set up, and uh, it was a drag. And then I ended up, uh, uh, was it Riley Flattery from Wisconsin? I think I said his name right. It's not in front of me. I'm just guessing. Um, he sent me a link to a uh, Microsoft thread um, where uh, basically the RASDial32 um, or RASDial EXE in System32 you can run that appended with the name of the VPN co connection you've set up appended with username and password um and then that will initiate that VPN connection. Where that's useful is you can set up a scheduled task that at startup, it runs this. So then as soon as the system boots up, you know, it establishes a network connection and in the login screen, it will dial my, you know, L2TP IPsec VPN. Uh, so I solved my problem without having to use OpenVPN. I'm sure if I were to go back and do it the way you're supposed to do it, it wouldn't be as you know nearly as difficult. But uh, well, I've done it this other way, and so that's probably what I'll do. Josh, you, know? you got it working, <laughs> and you'll you'll probably never have to do it again, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm going to end up rolling it out across all of their laptops just because, uh, just for good measure. Even the ones that are, you know, in the area of, you know, of the, uh, you know, offices. Um, but then I'm, uh, so then I went a couple steps beyond, and then I set up some uh, persistent static routes. They call them persistent, but they're only persistent if the connection is actually up, which is good. Um, so that, you know, if the VPN's up, then it'll send only certain, you know, routes over the VPN. So that way, it's not, you know, shoving all of their, uh, you know, YouTube and Spotify and whatnot over the VPN and just, just chewing up time, uh, you know, on the VPN concentrator. Just sends the couple prefixes they need and, and away we go. 
Yeah, I don't think I've ever actually tried to do an always on sort of connection. What uh, what does it do if it fails to connect? Does it attempt to reconnect at any point, or does um, it just try it the yeah, once the, and give up? Oh, well, like in the in the VPN's setup, I you know I had the box checked, you know if drop attempt to reconnect, uh, but then uh, I guess I never actually simulated what happens if it doesn't work right away. But I believe uh, Task Scheduler has a built-in mechanism for you know retrying if it misses the run, you know retrying if it fails. Um, you know I would assume that we give some sort of I can't even think of the name the, the right term right now, but you know exit code or whatever to you know signify that it exited cleanly or that it exited with a failure. Um, but uh, I assume something like that's happening. I guess I could set it up on another one and test it, see what happens. I'm just curious. You know, Might you know, end up having to do some kind something. of scripting or something in there to to check whether it's connected and then to retest something like that. I'd probably rig something. These are all Windows machines, right? Yeah. Yeah, you could probably auto it something up. I've it, done that uh, before plenty of times. It, uh, but then I think Windows 10, I think you just like check a box now. Like, oh. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> Yep, just uses VPN all the time. Okay. Nice. I, mean, like, I haven't tried it, but I read that Windows 10 it was a lot easier. And if you have Server 2016, uh, and you use the Microsoft uh, routing and remote access functionality, which I'm always like, who who would, why would you run that? Uh, apparently with it, um, you can do an always-on VPN thing, uh, set up via group policy and a bunch of other stuff. You know, down to the Windows 7 and current clients. So they have some way of doing it. I don't Very know nice. How. Very nice. Let's see. What else do we have on the list? Unimus. Um, Unimus has some US mum vouchers. So go to unimus.net and bother Thomas about it. If he runs out at some point, then uh, last I checked, Disher. Steve Disher at ISP Supply still had a few, so you could probably bug him. Uh, so we actually also have uh, some vouchers for the EU mom as well. So huh? US mom, EU mom, just let us know. We've got you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> get in there. Get you some. Free is great. I um, guess you you probably get a lot more call for vouchers at the uh, EU mom than you do at the US mom, right? So actually, so far we've only given out uh, a few vouchers. So there there's still a bunch left. There you go. Because like uh, if you sign up as a vendor they give you x number of vouchers i guess with your vendor thing right yeah yeah if you get a booth you you get some free vouchers for you know whoever you want to give them out to all right so get in there and get you some or just register a whole lot of fake names and beards and mustaches it'll work <laughs> whatever the free thing is this year uh let's see what else we have Siklu has some 70 80 gigahertz gear they're doing 10 gig wireless links what say you guys about that? It'll be interesting to see if it, um, you know, if they can maintain a 10 gig link at, you know, the modulation that they say. Um, you know, 80, 80 gigahertz is is pretty touchy. I mean, it doesn't take much to to drop modulation at, at 80 gig. What what um, distances are they saying with these things? Are these just a few hundred meters sort of thing? Uh, I haven't seen any claims, but uh, Justin Miller just hopped on. Uh, do you have some of the five and a half gig sick loose going, or? I do. Uh, what sort? What? Uh, what sort of range do you get on those, and still maintain good modulation? Surprisingly, pretty far. To be honest with you. Yeah. Um. Uh, you know, I mean, one <coughs> two kilometer areas. Oh yeah. Or, one okay. kilometer is no, no problem at all. Um, but you could do two as well. We were talking about the uh, 70, 80 gigahertz stuff that they are just talking about doing the, the 10 gig full duplex the, links with. The 8010, yeah. It's pretty. Yeah, those, those, look, those look like just an upgraded version of the um, 5500. They look fairly small in kind of the uh, marketing slicks they put together on them. So I'm guessing the range has to be pretty short. I mean, you're probably well, just hopping across the road on those things. Yeah, I, mean, it's the same, I think it's the same as the ether halls, what I've seen. What would that What would that be in your estimation for full modulation? 
full modulation um, where it starts to drop off. Yeah. I'd have to look at the link calculator they have. I don't want you to actually look at facts. I want you to just pull something out of your butt. <laughs> Well, I'm pulling up an, an 80 gig we have here. It's 1,871 meters, so whatever that that works out to be. Um, and it's, uh, it's a gig by gig. Um, RSSI is NIG 40 on one side, NIG 42 on the other side. Um, and that's pretty much target for that link. Um, it's got a three-foot three-foot dish on one side and a two-foot dish on the other side hmm. um, and it it in rain it fades about 20 20 to 30 db it uh they have they have the ether hall 8010 on the link budget calculator for sickle i'm looking at it right now yeah with the introduction of ether hall 8010 Market a very it, uh, close, a very it, cost uh, effective ten gig product. There, I believe, like the two and a half gig and the and the five gig radios are actually louder than their older, you know, six hundred meg and one gig stuff, and so they can probably maintain that same module, you know, or you know, higher higher modulations at the same same distance as yours, Justin, because it's louder by yeah, probably before five dB. Yeah, yeah these are. They're saying a um, combination of flexible high capacity with long two range. Two kilometers, you're looking at um, 9,550 mega, megabits, and then uh, it starts dropping like 99% at 9550, 99.9% .9 at 9550, and then it drops 9995. So if you would get full modulation, just not all the time. 99.9% .9 of the time, you'd have full modulation. Mm. In K rain zone, where I'm at. It, um, uh, and uh, if you're looking for a a more accurate way of determining um, your Link's capability of handling rain, um, I just add to the show notes my Google Sheet that I've created. Um it does require you to know more than a couple things about your setup, but um, you fill in frequency, distance, transit power, <laughs> trans you know, uh, antenna gains, um, and what your target receive signal is, um, as well as you you pull some uh, some path loss information from one of the other sheets, and it will tell you uh, how many inches of rain per hour um, you can take on that link before you break full modulation because uh, those like the you know I don't think the ITU uh, the ITU uh, you know rain region stuff is really all that accurate anymore because things have really changed um, and it's like averaging over the whole year you know I don't really care how I, you know, how my link is over the course of the whole year. I want to know what it is, like, you know, when does it go down? Yeah, what's the worst? Yeah, uh, and so this this calculator will tell you. Uh, I downside. I linked. I dropped the PDF of what I was looking at in our Slack channel on the podcast. Slack channel. Okay. okay. You can take a look at it. I just did it with three three kilometers, and uh, you can actually get a full ten gigs out of that. 99% um, of the time, and then 99.9% .9 of the time, it's saying 50, um, about 5 gigs. Now, is that 99, 99% even? Um, I, I don't, you know, look at, I'll, I'll save this one and you can look at it too. Hmm. It's not 99% even, it's quite a bit of downtime. Yeah. At, uh, let me see, yeah, at uh, 2,000 meters, we're looking at, uh, Freaking washed out thing. Um, yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> even that uh, three nines. It'll do the full full ten gig at three nines. Okay. Uh, it looks like that link doesn't ever achieve five nines. Um, is there any cost but, estimate on this stuff? That's with the one foot dish as well. Oh, okay. So you could go up to a two-foot dish and yeah, 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 yeah. 
Uh, let me, uh, I'll do that one now, and I'll save that in the channel, too. You guys can take a look. Mm, nice. It's interesting. Any, uh, but, yeah, but any idea of uh, what a oh, full that, length that, would cost, price-wise? This is, price -wise? This is ten, it's about 10 grand a length. Well, that's not bad. Uh, which is actually our, pretty uh, good because that's you know a dollar per megabit for the link, so that's getting a you know a 500 meg link for 500 bucks. It, w it would be the same you know dollar per megabit, and you're not going to get the same quality of link, you know, at 500 megs for 500 bucks as you are for 10,000 megs at 10,000 bucks. 80, 70 is that licensed range? Yeah, so yeah. it's not. It, it, uh, yeah, it's it's a pseudo like like you know you you uh, you get like a nationwide license and then you like register each link. I believe is how yeah. that works. Well, when you do it yeah. with Siklu, Siklu registers it, and it's under them. They have the yeah. nationwide things. They have all the registrations. You do it that way. Hmm. Nothing stopping you from doing it on your own, but. <laughs> yeah, it's a, and I believe uh, Micronet's website, you can generate uh, both Excel sh uh, sheets and a uh, KMZ of all of the 70, 80 gig links in a given, you know, search area. Um, so then, you know, on the KMZ, you know, then you can go up into Google Earth and see, you know, who else has a link in your area. Uh, obviously, most areas aren't going to have a lot. Um I think Indy has like five or ten within like a hundred miles of Indianapolis. Um whereas and, in my area I've got like five per building. <laughs> well and the beam widths are so tight that you can you can get by with a, a whole lot more than what, what people are used to with licensed as well. Oh yeah. It uh it uh on those uh uh, two foot dishes. Um, that 10 gig uh, radio will will do. Uh, it's, it'll, it will still do the full 10 gig at three and a half nines. Four nines, it's doing eight gigs. Um, so you know it's you know most of the time you're gonna get you know was it other than 52 minutes a year you're gonna get over eight gigs of throughput on it. That's pretty good. Hmm, interesting. All right. So, you guys beat this one to death. You ready to move on? Yeah, good. Good deal. Sure. All right, so something that was more... Uh, well, I a quick, tan uh, a, uh, quick tangent off of that. Yeah. You know, I had you know, mentioned my calculator. I was playing around comparing different radios in, in different bands uh, when I made it. Um, and it was surprising to see that at... I think I had like an 1800 meter link. Uh, <coughs> so similar to what Justin's uh, 80 gig is at, I compared what an Ignite Net uh, 42 dB antenna would be like compared to an Air Fiber uh, 24. And, uh, you know, you would think that 60 gigahertz at that range is going to be terrible. Um, and up until I believe half an inch per hour of rain is actually a better connection than the 24. Uh, once you exceed half inch of rain per hour, um, you know, logic, you know, flips back to the other side, to the, uh, you know, air fiber, uh, you know, holding it. But uh, it just kind of blew my mind that something that high a frequency and that cheap is still going to hold out, you know, better for a certain amount of time. Hmm. The uh, WAP 60s, we've got a bunch of those deployed now, and we have some deployed um, much further than 100 meters, and they work great. My only complaint is that they come with hard coded passwords in them uh, when you buy the match pair. So you have to keep track of that stuff. Uh, if they ever get factory reset, only don't have the password, the only way to get past it is to net install the thing. That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't so, think about factory default. Uh, going back to actually out, having that password. Yeah. Yeah, I just assumed if you factory defaulted, it would be no password. 
It nope. actually goes you, back you to reset the thing, password. and it has the password in it. The password's hard coded in it, just like the fact, like the factory uh, uh, big on it. So it, what I what um, I did was I I net install it and do uh, install a new default config, and the only thing in there literally is that system identity is set to unconfigured. There's no password on the username or anything. So it's basically just blanking it out. I don't have to worry about it. Nice. <laughs> yeah, which I guess they, you know, but you know, I was thinking they did that to kind of help keep out some of the, you know, IT newbies. They're just throwing things up. Um, this is IT newbie heaven, man. This it's so easy to put these things up. Like, <laughs> yeah, there's like no alignment at all. You just journal direction and you got a link and it works and it's been pretty reliable and pretty fast are you running the newest rcs or are you just running what came shipped uh 641 stuff whatever is the latest 641 yeah. i haven't actually upgraded any of them since. yeah i heard somebody say that um what did they tell me they said every time a new rc comes out give it a try because they're making uh improvements uh pretty yeah. much constantly on those those wap 60s if any indication on how the the WAP 60s work? The LHG 60s are gonna blow it out of the water. I mean, can't wait. <laughs> yeah, I have I have no idea when those things are actually supposed to hit uh, the market or whatever. I know they were announced a million years ago. It, uh, yeah, they oh. they were supposed to hit market last year, so mm -hmm. we'll see. But uh, I suppose that the coming months the EU and the US Mumby hopefully will get some more details. It uh it uh I'll get noticed you know, you know, I'll get noticed when uh when uh when they get FCC certified so we'll at least have that much you know known when they're coming. Yeah. Most of the time they're coming within a month or so after certification, so All right, very cool. All right, <clears throat> a quick rant, quick diatribe, uh, just to see what you guys think, weigh in on it. So that I, I can sort of appreciate is I've been getting a lot of work lately, a lot of design work um, for people that are going with um, uh, VARs, value added reseller, right? So what does that basically mean? Uh, a VAR is going to come in and they'll do a design for you, um, and they'll sell you the hardware, um, something. And I'm not saying this is devious or mischievous in any way, but a lot of times a VAR's number one job is to sell you equipment, right? So they're, they're helping you come up with a design and all that stuff. But I can't think of a single instance, a single scenario where I've been brought in prior or after that's happened where I wouldn't have cut out a huge equipment purchase. Um, and again, I, I never want to assume the worst of people that they're being purposely um, obtuse about why somebody needs equipment. Uh, there's been a couple of instances where I said, well, you know, why do you have this thing? There's, uh, they, I'm not sure. They, they told me I needed this, so we bought this. And um, it seems like uh, just recently one of these guys probably would have saved somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 grand had they just talked to somebody that wasn't necessarily trying to sell them hardware another one um they were getting pushed really hard to put a firewall in front of their isp right which is i'm not saying that's terrible i just don't know anybody that actually does that right there's there's a really a lot of negatives associated with that um and and to that end it was one firewall so it's you know single point of failure um but just very expensive hardware install so i would say find a consultant Find a friend, find anybody, find many people um, that will give you a second opinion uh, on whether you need to make all these equipment purchases or not. Um, hopefully somebody uh, that you can trust. Uh, sometimes a lot of the people listening to this are new WISPs, right? And they don't have that sort of safety net. You know, if somebody they can trust in the industry to go and, and find somebody to, to, to help a system with that. But um, uh, give me a call. Look on the consultant list, find somebody that's not actually a hardware vendor necessarily. And I'm not saying it's terrible, and I'm not saying that everybody has a bad experience. I'm just saying um, the amount of money people generally pay me, uh, they'll save probably five times that by not buying a superfluous piece of equipment that they didn't actually need. Uh, so just kind of putting that out there. 
Um, there's a lot of different ways to engineer a network. I see Mike smiling. There's so many different ways of skinning this cat. Um, and absolutely, you can buy a Ferrari and drive it to the end of your driveway to check your mailbox, but you probably don't need it. So uh, maybe ask somebody. That's the end of my diatribe on that. I'm just going to see what you guys think about that. Well, that's why I never, you know, for my company, I never wanted to become a hardware reseller because you fall into the trap of, well, all the all these different companies run these behind the scenes promotions. Hey, if you, you know, if you as the as the distributor, hey, if you sell so many of this widget this yeah. month, you know, you'll get a free trip or you'll, you know, we'll give you a bonus or, you know, you, you know, it, it's, it's all multi-level marketing type stuff. Yeah. You know, they've, they've learned from these guys. Yeah. So it, it incentivizes the, the distributor to say, well, we'll push this product a little more this month. Yeah. Um, so you, you got a little of that going on. And then you also have the, um, you know, the vendor that says, well, if you go with our total solution, you need this, 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 and this, and you, you might not necessarily need all of that. Yeah, it might be a good solution um, because you're doing the total package, but if you look at it as, at a, as an overall solution, um, you know, there might be parts of that package that aren't necessarily good pieces. Um, you know, there's been tons of vendors over the years. Um, I can think of a, a certain billing vendor. Um, they had a very, or they still have a very good billing product, but they had this drop-in box. Um, so you put this box on the network, and the box was supposed to do all this magic stuff. Well, the box was kind of a failure, and they went away from the box, <clears throat> and now no one, no one really uses this box. And you know they, they pushed it for quite a while, um, and it was it wasn't good. So you, you get that that kind of thing, and you know someone with a fresh perspective comes in and says, "Well, why are you doing that?" Well, they told me to do that. Well, okay, let's you know let's look at your design. Do do you really need that? Yeah, and and these guys you're talking to, they have quotas. Right. There's a, t yep. there's a, I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of pressure on them to move gear. Right. And so for good or for bad, you know, maybe that's going to make them make some poor decisions. You know, I, and again, I don't want to talk bad about anybody. Um, and another thing I would definitely steer people away from is, uh, and, and, and it kind of clicked in my head when you were saying it is that the total package solution, I've heard of a couple of VAR slash consultants that are doing this thing where you sign a contract, an exclusive contract with them. And you're the only one that can sell them equipment. Yep. And I've heard some horror stories coming out of that. Um, you know, when you're when you're locked in and you can't price shop, you can't get outside help. Um, you want to bring up a new micro pop. You know, they're gonna make you buy. You know, uh, and then from what I've hear, uh, a Siklu, a piece of Siklu gear that can do you know a couple of gigs. And this is a site that's only gonna have maybe 20 customers out in the sticks, you know, but you're still going to have to buy their top of the line gear, mm -hmm. which they're getting the margin off of. Right. So it's, um, be very wary of somebody that's forcing you. And I've heard in some situations like that, the person basically just scuttles that ISP and then starts up a whole new one with a new LLC and a new name, everything just so that they can get out from underneath those contracts. And that's insane mm -hmm. that you'd have yeah. to, to go to those links just to, um, you know, keep your business afloat because of the theoretically promised margins that you're going to get and the promised number of customers you're going to be able to turn up. And, and that doesn't come to fruition. And you have this huge bill coming from these guys and you just can't survive. So I just, I don't want anybody to set themselves up for failure. So be very cautious with those sorts of scenarios. Hmm. For the low, low price of $8 a month, you can become a developer with, uh, a patron Slack subscriber, and you can ask us all these questions. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I'm not saying any. <laughs> I'm not saying any of us have time to sink hours and hours. Hey, we're we're good guys. We're nice guys. We love answering quick questions. But I, I doubt we're gonna sink hours in for free. But um, definitely, if you have a quick question, there's a whole lot of differing opinions, and everybody's, you know, you. Just, it's like, what do they say? It's like assholes. Everybody's got one. 
uh, and we're ready for you to take a look at ours. Take that from what that is. <laughs> yeah, everybody wants to give their opinion for sure. And it's great. I love it. So you're going to get a lot of different viewpoints. Um, what I like about it, too, is we're fostering kind of a very welcoming, open environment. It doesn't matter what your skill level is. There's going to be some names in the Slack that you recognize from the forums, not just from this. Um, and they're there to help you guys along. You know, they're learning just as much as you are along the way. And I know some different forums uh, and it's in every forum. Uh, there's going to be guys in there that are a bit cancerous. And we're trying to keep that out of this. Right. Just that's be... why Wilson's not in there. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we only let Mike have so many comments uh, per day. No, uh, it's just, you know trying to keep it a welcoming environment because I know before this has happened to me personally, I, I've sort of grown past it. I kind of don't give a crap anymore. Um, what people think, but I used to think, man, this guy really knows his stuff. I can't ask this stupid question. Um, because he'll think I'm stupid. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I don't want everybody to just jump on my ass because I asked such a dumb question. That's, that's, you know, that's not here. Um, which I really like. Uh, but mostly we've got a lot of really high level guys in whatever they do. Uh, which is awesome. I love that. Uh, for me personally, just because I have this huge pool of people I can, I can tap to ask questions. Um, <laughs> and that's, uh, but um, back on your original diatribe here, mm -hmm. um, I remember Packet Pushers talking about this sometime in the past few months. <clears throat> the same sort of thing of really of people buying things that they just don't need. Or no, it was it Packet Pushers or it was uh, Network Collective? Uh, one of them was talking about, you know, clients that, you know, get conned in, you know, one form or another of buying stuff that they don't need. Um, and you just look at it like, what are you going to do with this box now? Like, it, sitting there. Yeah. Well, it's just funny because, I don't know, like, I, I do some university work and I work with those guys a lot. And they have these budgets and they got to get rid of them. So it's like, we can buy all this just crap at the end of the year or... We'll buy everybody brand new Herman Miller chairs. You know what I mean? It's like if we don't spend this money, then they don't give it to us next year. They actually uh, deduct how much we're going to get. You know, I mean, it goes bound by percentage, X percentage or whatever. So they have to get rid of it. So in those scenarios, I guess, you know, buying crap for the sake of buying crap is fine. Uh, but when generally uh, when you're a wisp, you're, a lot of those guys are, you know, living hand to mouth. So you got to. You know, if it if it's the difference between uh, making making payroll that month or uh, buying this new gear, yeah, I definitely see uh, an advantage to not doing that. Uh, I'm staying very cool on that one. Uh, that one's <laughs> that one's one I get somewhat heated about. I don't like people being taken advantage of. I'm not a big fan of that. So I uh, I'll just and, I'll and leave I it right there. You know, when I come into a situation like that, it it always makes me. You know, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to make the the some some people you can you can tell they they just well I I just bought this because I was told to buy this and you don't want to go and say you got taken dude you know you you're you bought an 11 gigahertz backhaul to go you know two miles to service 10 customers and that's probably all you're ever going to service and yeah. you know did you need that 11 gigahertz backhaul and eh, well you know that's you know, it's like, uh, so, okay, let's, let's make the best of what you have. And so it, it becomes a, you know, it, it becomes a philosophical debate, debate at that point. Yeah. So, well, sometimes too, it'll be, Hey, buy this specialized appliance. That's very expensive. Yeah. Um, with the customer not realizing that the routers they have are already capable of doing that. You know, yeah. it's just, they were never Sounds told. like power code. They're. BMU thing or whatever. Their BMU that they put on the edge. Yeah, because that does rate limiting and stuff. I'm talking about, um, uh, for example, this one guy bought an appliance that was supposed to uh, put in some quality of service and then all of the rate limits for the customers, right? And they're going to do PPPoE. So why not just have that be a radius attribute that pass passes over to your PPPoE server and then Bob's your uncle. You've got a rate limit for your customer right there. Um, so it's just it's things like that that drive me crazy. Um, let's get off this before I get salty and toasty. Uh, cause yeah, yeah. It's it, just ask for help. Ask for help. Um, something new that I wanted to try out is a challenge every week, right? 
Uh, so the idea here is Tide Pods. Tide Pods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that it's like millennial sushi. You got to eat it with chopsticks. Um, uh, not that I'm knocking millennials. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. So the challenge, come up with something. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be technology super related or WISP related or ISP related. Um, it could just be something that's interesting that maybe grows us as a person. I want uh, people on the podcast to participate if they will you've got two weeks to do whatever this thing happens to be can't be that difficult to get that done and i would love our listeners to participate as well so we have a google doc started with challenges in here and if you're a patron subscriber you you actually have right access to this thing so you can throw in your ideas in here as well uh and if we pick yours you got your name on here so you can get credit for it unless i guess you want to leave your name off that's fine uh, so far, we've got about 10 entries, which is more than I thought we'd have right off the bat. Um, i got plenty of ideas. <laughs> well, you, they They're don't exist. Bad. Put them, put them <laughs> on the... Yeah, I see your idea in there. I'm about to strike <laughs> through it. Uh, so uh, I thought we'll discuss on this one really quick and figure out which challenge we're going to do. And then next week, after we do said challenge or we'll report back, uh, maybe record in kind of a little quick after show that's patron only where we discuss whatever the challenge happens to be and then announce it away something like that uh let's see how it goes so uh on the list now um we've got do some form of home automation this is actually mine i've i've, I've done tons of arduino microcontroller stuff I like controlling the real world with computers but i've never actually branched out to doing anything home automation and that could be uh, I think that's open for interpretation. It could be, yeah, like do one of your little. I don't know. Does that count? Like if you order, you could program laundry? it to do whatever you want. All right, all right. Well, I mean, I was gonna say like even an Alexa or uh, a Google Home. I guess that's home automation ish, right? I don't know. Turn on a light switch or something. Uh, you know, through I don't know anything with an app. I don't know. That was that was sort of one I threw out there. I'm gonna skip over what Mike put on his. <laughs> All right. Email all your tower equipment vendors and ask them to put SFPs in the radio. You're an idiot. Um, <laughs> Mike put implement. Oh, speaking of turning on a power switch, our power just came back. Booyah. <laughs> oh, nice. Perfect timing. Couldn't, couldn't you have said that earlier? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like your power company was, it was, it needed to say, Alexa, turn on the light. Yeah. That's all it was. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Josh okay. said, say three nice things about a vendor you've bashed, which I think is funny. Here's one that I thought was particularly interesting. Admit three tech-related, uh, three things tech-related that you know nothing or next to nothing about. That one kind of terrifies me because part of my personality used to be I had to guy that, <laughs> be the guy that knows everything. I'm past that now, um, but it still kind of like claws at me a little bit. Uh, I said give some honest positive feedback to your employees not just negative right so like make a point to talk to your guys um i think we all get into a rut you know and like the guys that do well we forget about them right who are we worrying about we're worrying about the guys that are always screwing up and we're always focusing on them so sometimes we forget to throw an attaboy at them you know another one i came up with uh which i firmly believe in is for everybody just give it a swing do a weekly one-on-one -on -one with your direct employees. And that's like 30 minutes where you just sit down and they talk. And when they're done, then you get a chance to talk. If they eat up the whole 30 minutes, that's fine. Right. Um, cause I think that's actually super important. Uh, let's see. I had somebody talk to say the pig behind him. I'm looking around who I can talk to here. <laughs> I think I got some inanimate objects I can well, talk I mean, to. <laughs> we don't all have direct employees. I get it. I get it. Uh, help one non-tech person, small business owner, think through them using tech to improve, expand their business this quarter. That's interesting. Um, let's see. Set up and populate an internal wiki for documentation. Uh, use Zapier or... Oh, if to, 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 to automate some part of your business, internal workflow, you know, if then, uh, what? If, if then, then do this. yeah, yeah, whatever it is. Or, and then yeah. also, <laughs> uh, shut up, Miller, uh, use an Arduino to monitor some part of your wisdom structure. Or if you guys have anything else that you want to throw out, 
do you have any ideas? What would you like to do for the challenge? And everybody on here is capable of participating in the challenge. I'm looking at you, Miller. I'm looking at you, Mike. Lazy bastards. We actually have to do something, or is this yes. just make a plan? No, no. We're picking the thing that we're going to do, and then you have to execute it before the next podcast. And be ready to talk about it. <laughs> it doesn't have to, I mean, you don't have to, like, have every switch in your house automated or anything like that. You know what I mean? It's like, you know. Just pick a thing and give it a little try. Give I got it a, a garage taste. door opener that's Wi-Fi connected. Gonna... I guess I guess that would I guess that would count. Ooh, open it from this. And you could talk about your experience with said device. Yeah. Do you guys want to try some form of home automation? I've never done anything, and I've uh, Andrew Cox was kind enough to gift me some stuff, and it's still sitting in the box that it came in. And this would be a good excuse for me to actually put it into use. Yeah, I got several Alexa things I've ordered. I got a bunch of I got a bunch of X10 in the house that needs to go away. What's the what's the new hotness? Like the Z-Wave or something? Z-Wave's kind of the <laughs> oh, the standard. Um, you know, it was the kind of the uh, X10 um, replacement with its hub and and stuff like that. That was kind of the what a lot of people went to after X10. Um, you know, now there's uh, the you know the Alex enabled um, stuff. Um, Life Master has one. Um, Tom's Guide. Um, I I always like Tom's Guide. He's got a really nice uh, write up on Alexa compatible devices that I I read not too long ago, and I ordered some things from from there. All right, nice. All right, well, we'll make that the challenge. Do some form of home automation, and that includes all of you listeners, especially if you've never done one. That's that's kind of the boat I'm in. Thankfully, somebody's already taken the uh, figure out what you're going to get part, and I'll just use some of the stuff that Andrew. So it's right. I can see it. It's right back there in a box on the floor. So I'll do that. And loose, open for interpretation. Do what you can. This includes Slovakians. I know you're there. Uh. <laughs> Do you guys have anything else? You ready to stick a fork in it? I wanted to mention the um, the whole changing your website to HTTPS stuff. Um, mm, oh, everybody, man. you know, everybody who has a website basically has till June. Um, is it June twenty eighteen? It's either June or July. Um, you need to have your website uh, properly HTTPS enabled or you're not going to show up in page rankings. Cloudflare is going to dump you. Google's going to mark you as unsecure. Um, you're going to get the warning. Um, this is an unsecure site, whether you have a valid certificate or not. Um, so if you got a, you know, if you got a HTTP site now, come June, Google's going to mark you as an unsecure site. Well, you an, if you don't have an SSL certi certificate for it. Sure. Yeah. To, you know, but just for generic stuff, like, like, not even talking contact forms or anything. It's just if your site isn't completely SSL enabled, um, correct. Which I think is a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty crappy. It's. I am completely against the encrypt everything movement. There's zero need for it. Yes. I don't so have anything on any of my websites that anybody needs it to be encrypted for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're Joe <laughs> Smo out there and you got a, you know, a website, there's no reason you need a secure certificate. But, uh, but you know, Google knows, Google knows best, so that's what everybody has to do. Yeah, right. with uh, well, there's a there's a version of, of Google Chrome coming that. Uh, you know, once that Google Chrome's out there, it will say, you know, the the big bad, scary. This is an insecure website. You must click here to continue. You know, you got to click two or three times to go to the website. That'll happen on any website that's not SSL enabled. Have you run into the situation where you have an old device and you can no longer manage it because it it yeah. the SSL cert on it is so old that these uh, ciphers. Google won't even yeah. show it. Yeah. I think like old APC web cards were like that and some other things that run across. It's just like, God. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, like, and what's so annoying is that, like, they don't include any 
like you know power user you know administrator level functions to re-enable that it's like hmm. no like you know i understand keeping joe schmo consumer away from those things because they don't know what they're getting into but you know there should be some sort of you know multi-factor you know yes i agree i want this turned to you know turned back on yeah give me a power user function Hmm. Um, so I think there is two sides to this. Like there should definitely be options and, and power user. If I want to go somewhere, they shouldn't restrict me to go somewhere. Yes, there should be multiple checkboxes and whatever. But uh, on the other side, like uh, today to to actually get a website that's fully encrypted and and with free certificates and everything is extremely easy. If if you are hosting it on your own, you have Let's Encrypt, which. <laughs> I mean, it's honestly, it's a one-liner to use it at this point. It's it's extremely easy. And uh, another part of this debate is even if you are hosting a website, uh, it's it's much better for a multitude of reasons to have it hosted somewhere. Like Amazon AVS makes it uh, literally three clicks to to host a fully encrypted and geo cached uh, website with CloudFront. Then you have like all, a myriad of services which which will do that for you, and I'm not talking about just you know secure it, but but completely host and secure it. So, I think on one hand it has gotten easier than ever to actually properly have a fully encrypted website, but on the other hand, uh, you know Chrome should never completely ban you from accessing something you want. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's it's easy, you know, like you say, with Let's Encrypt, you know, especially with Let's Encrypt and Virtual Man, you know, if you're doing hosting yourself, you know, it's a couple clicks and it phones home and you got a you got an SSL cert that, you know, renews every 30, 60 days, whatever it is, and you kind of forget about it. It, uh, it's, uh, or like, you know, something like, uh, you know, Cloudflare, you know, I have my websites are, you know, Cloudflare accelerated so you know it's in all of their you know you know on their free service you know any of the cdn nodes that they use for their free service you know my website serves out of there and it's just a checkbox you know use ssl okay that's fine um so you know i take it you know i didn't i didn't do the ssl at first because i saw no need to and then it was about a year ago i think google made some hint about you know page rank relating to SSL so I so I did it then like not that you wouldn't show up but that you know you know there'd be a slightly better score to somebody that was so I did that um quick tangent you know I talked about these you know guys quick mentioned earlier um there's another podcast network collective um it seems like more like network consultant type people mostly um but uh, they had one episode, uh, um, the impact of increasing encrypted traffic, and they talk about for you know businesses, enterprises, you know information security type stuff, um, you know to to have you know IP protection, not you know internet protocol, but intellectual property. You know, monitoring, um, you know, people emailing away, you know, trade secrets and, you know, design, you know, you know, new product design stuff and whatnot. Um, you know, they they have to, you know, watch all of you know you know those types of companies watch all of your traffic, and the amount of money they have to spend on boxes to completely. You know, man in the middle, everything now, um, and you know, not just that, but but that because now everything is being encrypted. You know, they have to look at everything before, um, which it's been two months since I heard the episode, so I could be greatly slaughtering their their points. Uh, but you know, back in the day. You know, things that were encrypted were, you know, bank statements and, you know, purchases and things. And those things should be encrypted. And so companies didn't break the encryption on those things because it was, you know, it was 
encrypted for a reason. But now everything's encrypted. <coughs> so they just decrypt everything. You know. Yeah. You know, I actually yeah. went to a um a lunch and learn this week hosted by the FBI and they were talking about intellectual property protection was one of the things they were discussing. And they were saying that it's actually somewhat difficult to um, prosecute on some of that stuff. They said you have to be taking reasonable efforts, right? It, it, that's supposedly some legal language that's reasonable efforts. What are reasonable efforts? So um, anything you want to protect, you have to segment off. You know, you have to take measures like passwords expire. You have to um, have process and procedures associated with that stuff. Um, and you have to make sure that you're following and you have to be able to prove that you're following it. You know, they said um, most of IP theft comes from the trusted insider. So um, in organizations, especially so uh, one of our sister companies does research and development for government grants and things like that. Um, so, um, you know, a scientist will be working on something. But if you silo that silent scientist, you know, and, and they can't talk to other scientists about what they're working on, there's a lot that's lost in there, you know, I mean, somebody else could have, um, have been working on something for years that could positively impact that project instantly. Right. But if you share that information, well, then you open yourself up to these risks, right? So now this trusted insider has access to things that's not necessarily in their purview. So if they copy all of that stuff, because it's something that they have been given access to, that's not considered, um, attempted escalation of privileges or anything like that. You gave them access to this uh, information. So all that stuff just gets so sticky and convoluted. And, you know, how do you actually protect yourself from things like that? It's, it's, it's pretty hairy these days to try and do that stuff. Um, I know Thomas has got a big piece of IP he's working on protecting. Um, but all of your programs are inside, right? So say you had an outside resource. How do you go about protecting yourself from those sorts of things? You know, what's funny is um, I never thought the FBI would. So if somebody tries to steal my intellectual property, the FBI here in the U.S. will actually attempt to prosecute on my behalf because they see it as, um, what do they call it? It's like the strength of your economy is part of the strength of the nation as a whole. So if they help to protect my um my patents and my you know my intellectual property that nobody else has then they're uh in turn helping out the entire country so they will actually prosecute on your behalf i, I never knew that was a thing um so if you get like hit with ransomware and stuff like that you're theoretically supposed to be able to call your fbi your local fbi agent they're supposed to help you out do you guys know that stuff i know they had a uh you know kind of a cyber security that would help you out more than a I had a crime you know they would they would help you out if you you had a breach or something because they're they're looking for hey this probably happened to somebody else yeah so they're looking at it from that perspective <clears throat> there was, they they had some quote and I'm not I'm gonna butcher this but they said basically um, all of the information all of the intellectual property that China has been extra ex, exfiltrating from the US recently what do they say? It's the largest transfer of like intellectual wealth in the history of mankind. Like all the theft, all the theft that's been happening. I mean, they say that they've been stealing stuff like um, paint formulas. I think DuPont had a bunch of paint formulas stolen by China, you know, and then genetic seed information has been stolen and, you know, just all kinds of crazy stuff like that. All these other countries stealing our our tricks mm -hmm. i don't know that's at, a tangent oh yeah at uh um one other <coughs> you know thing that they mentioned in that other cast was you know if if you can't afford the box to do man in the middle on everything um which you know in an enterprise environment is is easier to do because you know then you can install you know your CA certificate, um, you know into their device, you know because it's it's your device, so you own it. Yeah. So, so that you know, you know, so then, other than places like Google, and whatnot that do was it HSTS, where you know the browser actually knows which is the real certificate, you know, not just you know following, you know CA chains and whatnot, but um, other than that. Um, 
you know, that gets pretty heavy duty because you have to decrypt everything and then re-encrypt it as it's leaving. Um, so what, uh, you know, kind of some tactics people are left to do then is basically collecting flow data and trying to observe patterns and then trying to determine what's a good pattern and what's not a good pattern. Um, you know, blatantly obvious, you know, Bob works nine to five, you know, five days a week. And all of a sudden, you know, Sunday morning at 3 a.m., Bob's PC downloads 50 gigs from the file server and then 50 gigs goes out from his PC to, you know, some IP in China. That's obviously bad. <laughs> but how do you define the threshold without seeing the actual content? What, you know, what is bad and what's not bad? So that's kind of a whole new market of, you know, behavioral heuristics, you know, for employees' data usage of what's normal for this employee, what's not normal for this employee, and alarming on that. Sounds like something AI could be used to, you know, find that kind of stuff and identify it. It, uh, See that soon, probably. Stuff I don't know anything about. <laughs> Drop Bob down a hole. <laughs> yeah, it's all tricky. All that stuff's tricky. Trying to to protect yourself, right? And it's sometimes it feels like diminishing returns, right? It, it costs a lot of money to do that sort of thing. And not only money, but time and employees. And that's a pretty big investment. <clears throat> so at some point, you got to say, you know, how much is enough? Which, which now circles back to uh, Steve and Josh's, uh, our rant about security practices and yeah. what's good enough. Yeah. Because, I mean, theoretically, there's I've, I've read some stuff before that says the uh, monetary impact of a breach to companies really isn't nearly as big as you think it, it probably is. And, um, you know, if you, if you think a company's going to get a breach and that that's going to somehow... <clears throat> Uh, make customers not go there. It's just that's not the case. You know, after well, um, Home Depot, everyone's still shopping at shopping at Target. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Target got hit. Yeah. Home Depot got hit. Everybody still goes there like crazy. There was no but, no noticeable dip in their revenue. Uh, but um, but you know, I would I would say that it's probably inverse proportional to company size. You know, somebody huge like Target, they're gonna have very you know very little. Um, you know, you know, loss, which actually may, be, may which actually might be made up for by other people now coming to Target because not because they were, were stolen, but because you know <coughs> lines are shorter now or something. So you know that may offset. But you know, some small engineering company that you know there's six employees and you know all of their you know engineering project you know details are leaked or somehow. They have a much smaller customer audience, you know, so one or two of them get pissed off and leave. That's a big impact on the company. Yeah. You know, what's funny is this FBI agent was talking about how, um, uh, or actually he was a, he was a prosecutor for like cyber crimes and stuff like that. And he was saying that, um, one of the bigger targets nowadays are law firms. He said, because like these big, uh, companies, they have this complex, security system in place right all these these locks these safety measures these checks but when they have to do litigation for some sort of reason they have to turn over all of this uh evidence right so it's very specific stuff this very specific information over the law firms and so why try and fight your way in uh there when you can just come in through a law firm he was talking about um a chinese syndicate that wanted to buy this potash company i think in canada and so there were like four other buyers and they were all somewhere in Canada, so they just hacked, uh, got hacked. They hacked all the uh, law firms, so they knew how much everybody was bidding, uh, what offers they were making. I mean, they basically had the keys to the kingdom there um, because all of their representation had exactly how much they were willing to give, you know, what margins they were looking. So they, uh, I guess, at some point that got out before the deal happened, but yeah. I mean, it's 
it's pretty easy to win when you are playing poker and you see everybody's cards uh, yeah. beforehand. <laughs> so it's crazy. How far can you go down that rabbit hole? I don't know. Um, do you guys have anything else on this? You want to close it out? We're right at the hour, Mark. I'm good. All see you right. at Whisper America. Yeah. Get, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we got uh, Justin Miller. Uh, I assume you're going. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I fly out tomorrow at 6. At uh, Justin Wilson, myself, from uh, from the Builders Wisp is going. Um, there's a couple Facebook groups that have popped up for people that are going to the show for, you know, discussions at the show and, you know, arranging meetups and stuff. Um, hit us up if you want to know where that group is we'll uh send you an invite to it very cool all right let's close it out official like um before i forget this episode was brought to you again by our lovely sponsor sonar scalable intuitive comprehensive isp billing and operational support system learn more at sonar.software god I'm so good at that <laughs> <laughs> no no yeah yeah go uh go drop them uh go drop them a look if you like them be sure to tell them we send them the, uh your way uh for me uh Lord, no I always end with me we'll go uh thomas if people want to find you how do they do that get a flashlight oh, uh, <laughs> no the power is back on so hey <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah, just Google for me. Uh, I'm easy to find all the social networks, all the everything. Uh, Unimusnet, that's probably the easiest and fastest. And I will be at the European Mom in Berlin and then at the US Mom as well, which is all next month. So if anybody is at the Mom, come and say hi. Yeah, go to unimus.net, buy a software. Justin Wilson, if people want to find you out on the internet, how do they go about that? j2sw.com everything everything me booyah it's even nudes uh miller if people want to find you on the internet how do they do that uh the brothers with slack channel little brothers <laughs> now come on pimp that pimp that blog what do you got find static.net there you I go i haven't done anything on there in a while so. it doesn't matter it's still it's still a good resource. Uh, Mikey, how do people get a hold of you? Oof. You're not lying, Miller. It's been almost two years. Yeah, been busy. <laughs> been busy uh, not posting. It. Uh, I think I've said the same or some other thing in the past few shows. Uh, I'm busy, so leave me alone. All right, and that's his way of saying going to facebook.com forward slash the brothers west. That's where you're gonna find Mike. All of the juicy tidbits, all the people answering your stuff. That's all him. Uh, if you want to find me, you can hit me at gregsoul.com or just greg at gregsoul.com. That's an easy email. Um, I'd love to holler at you cats about doing all the things with the stuff. Um, I know somebody had asked about that, uh, that software backend thing that I'm working on. Um, my partner and I were calling in a hired gun. Uh, somebody you guys may have heard of or maybe not. I don't know. Uh, maybe if you were in the Slack channel, you would know this cat. Uh, so we're actually pulling in um, some hired help. I like to say he's going to help us make the cake and we're going to frost it. Uh, so he's going to do some of the heavy lifting, help us get some of this stuff done. So hopefully we'll have something very soon. Uh, accelerated timeline. I love it. Um, if you guys have any questions or comments, drop them in either Facebook or contact us at the Brothers Wish if you're an email kind of cat. Uh, other than that, questions, comments, please keep them coming. We love to interact. If you guys have any interesting challenges for us, send them our way. Please participate in the challenge. I want to see what everybody comes up with. Um, I guess that's it for us. Uh, Thanks, quick question everybody. on the Hurry challenges. Up. Hurry. Um, how do we – so if our audience wishes to participate in them as well, uh, what should they do with their, uh, you know – Whatever it is that your you know challenge of the week that we've done, you know. I'd say tweet at us, but I don't do the twitters. Uh, Put it on our Facebook. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put your put your results in there. Uh, put them in a little bit before the next cast, which happens every other Saturday. So today's the June for March third. It'll be the tenth. No, what is that? Seventeenth. Three plus fourteen. Yeah. I said 17th. It'll be 17th. Do the 17th. 
Uh, so the morning of the 17th or the 16th, something like that, put some stuff up there or email us about it. Or if you've got some really good stuff, do it before and we'll get you on the show and let you talk about it. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>